Welcome to Where Are They Now? We reach into the archives of Lenape, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Seneca High Schools and invite selected alumni to share memories and fill us in on their career paths after commencement. Since Lenape's first graduating class in 1961, Shawnees in 1972, Cherokees in 1978, and Senecas in 2005, over 65,000 individuals have received diplomas from these four schools. Here now is your host, DJ Deeney. Hello and welcome to Where Are They Now? Today's episode, we will be reconnecting with an alum from Shawnee's class of 2005, Jamie Franks. Jamie is the head men's soccer coach at the University of Denver and lives in Englewood, Colorado. Welcome to the show, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, going to go back to Shawnee High School 2005. I know a lot of your high school career focused around athletics and specifically soccer. Um, let's talk about some of your memories as far as Shawnee High School went. Yeah, I think the one that's most profound and sticks out in uh, my mind the most is just the ability to play with my older brother and my younger brother. Um, I think that's memories that I'll keep for the rest of my life. And um, I think some of the other players that I played with, we grew up playing on a, on a club team at U8 and U9. Well, so you played varsity soccer for all four years. Uh, you had a total record of 99-4-2. and two. You won a state championship in 2001 and 2003 and four times Coaches Cup winner. Four times South Jersey champions, three times Offensive Player of the Year, New Jersey Player of the Year, and a two-time All-American. So it's safe to say you did pretty, pretty well. Yeah, I think when you play at Shawnee, there's a bunch of other great players that you play with. And um, like I said, it, it started from a young age with our club team. So being able to share that with my teammates and to be able to uh, have all the success that we did, you know, the individual awards were great, but those aren't the things that I really remember. The, the championships, the coaches' titles, the, the South Jersey championships, and the, you know, the state championships is, you know, what sticks in mind the most. Now, focusing on some of the people that had an influence on your life at Shawnee, uh, Mrs. Williams, talk a little bit about her. Yeah, Ingrid Williams was, uh, she had motherly instincts, and uh, I had a class pre-calc and calc with her, so my junior and my senior year, and uh, I think just her ability to um, frame questions and, 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 and beg questions um, that made me think outside the box and do further research and really test myself, it, it really helped me prepare for, um, you know, the next stage of my life in college. Now, how about some of your coaches that might have had an influence on you? The... The first one and the one that I owe the most um, to is my dad. Uh, you know, my dad was the, the manager of the team and um, just uh, his ability to put good people uh, around him, the, the, the team, really had fostered our, our development. And the individual that he brought in that, that, that I owe the most to my actual soccer career is uh, an individual named Jake Bowman. You know, he lives over in Stratford. But he did it for free, um, you know, coached me from literally eight uh, years old until I was 15, 16 years old. And that's where my passion for the game grew. And when I got to high school, you know, Brian Gibney, uh, he was my coach for four years. And, uh, you know, we had a great relationship. He always allowed me to kind of play within myself, but always kind of taught me, you know, different type of lessons as a leader that was definitely helpful, you know, going into the next stage of my career. Now, during high school, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do? Did you think you were going to play soccer uh, as a career, or did, were you looking academically towards something specific? Well, I think I was a little bit of a dreamer my entire life, and I still kind of am. It, it started at a young age, and I think when I was in third and fourth grade, and, you know, I'm the kid that said, hey, I want to play professional soccer, I think there would be Snickers or kids uh, that would laugh. And, you know, that increased all the way, you know, through high school. And, um, I knew that I wanted to go and chase my dream of being a professional. And uh, I also knew, though, that there was a small percentage of Division I athletes, uh, 2% actually, that, 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 that get the opportunity to do that. So uh, all in all, the reason why I, I chose Wake Forest University is because uh, I needed something to fall back on my uh, degree. So you chose Wake Forest to play, but also for the academics that, th that they have. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so you majored in communication when you got there? Yes, that's what my bachelor's was in, uh, and then uh, a minor in uh, you know, business management. And how did that work out for you? 
uh, it was great. You know, I, uh, I graduated in three and a half years, which was uh, definitely difficult. Uh, I stayed all the summers um, to make sure that I was keeping up with my training for, for soccer while I was still taking classes. Um, it was definitely challenging. You know, it's a liberal arts school, so you get a background a little bit of everything. But uh, I think it really uh, equipped me, um, you know, for, for where I am now. Now, how about some teachers or coaches in college that may have been very influential on you? Yeah, I think one of the main reasons I went to Wake Forest was to play for uh, Jay Vitovich. Historically speaking, he's got to be one of the most successful coaches in college soccer. And when I went on my recruiting visit there, there was a holistic view about being a good person and giving back to the community. And um, it was much more than soccer. So um, my ability to... to <sighs> make myself a better person was kind of the driver of my decision and I think Jay held us accountable to all those things. Um, while I was there, the assistant coach that had recruited me there was my former boss here at the University of Denver. He's the one that brought me out to Colorado uh, and that's Bobby Muse. And um, from more of a professional standpoint, I've learned a lot from him, but you know, we first connected back at Wake Forest. Well, obviously the things at Wake Forest worked out pretty well at soccer. Uh, talk about the accomplishments you guys had there and some of the things that you were able to do while playing at Wake Forest. Yeah, I think when I went to Wake Forest, a lot of people were um, not surprised, but uh, shocked a little bit because they, at that time they had never been past the Sweet 16. And I was fortunate to go to three Final Fours, um, win a national championship, and then be on staff for their fourth Final Four. And, and the thing that I took away from the most and that I, that's still with me today was that that was all based on culture and getting the right people um, in the culture. And that although talent is important, it was about um, the culture and about accountability and high demand. And um, the experience at Wake Forest was something that, uh, you know, those guys are still my best friends. Those are the guys that stood up in my wedding. So um, a lot of great memories there. And, uh, you know, I just feel fortunate that I, that I made uh, the right decision for me. So you ended up ranked fifth overall with 95 appearances for Wake Forest. Uh, you graduate there, you said, three years, or three and a half years, rather. Uh, what happened after graduation for you? I got drafted, and it, my lifelong dream came true. And that was, uh, you know, I got drafted out to L.A. for uh, Chivas USA um, and then played my first professional season. Um, bounced around a little bit uh, after my days in Chivas. And then uh, after going into my third professional year, the opportunity at Wake Forest came up to be a coach. And I think uh, I was never the strongest. I was never the fastest. I definitely wasn't the biggest. Um, and every, any coach that I've ever played for told me that I have a unique skill set. And so when that opportunity arised, I, uh, I had to put uh, a little bit of my pride aside and realize that it was time to start my career. And even though it was a difficult decision, um, three weeks after I made that decision, I met my, uh, my, uh, my wife. So you pretty much... Uh, worked for Wake Forest after playing there. How long were you at Wake coaching? Yeah, so all you know, in total, I was at Wake Forest for seven years, four years as a player, and you know, three years on staff. Um, in between my professional seasons, I was actually heading back down to Winston Salem, uh, where Wake Forest is, and joining the staff in any capacity. So that was director of operations, that was volunteer, um, but just really any way that I could keep my foot in uh, the college game uh, and just see the other side of things. Um, was important for me. During your coaching career, before you got to where you are now, it sounds like you were also using your other actual degree to uh, for some of your positions. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think um, getting a bachelor's in communication was really important to understand what empirical and what rhetoric um, and how that uh, pertains to just everyday dialogue and to be able to think for myself and to be able to understand um, that there's a sender and a receiver in, in every message, it definitely helps me as a coach. Um, you know, uh, I'm in charge of, you know, 30 individuals and, uh, you know, I, I definitely utilize my, my bachelor's uh, in communications all the time. Now, didn't you also do some video work when you were doing these positions? Yeah, yeah, when I was at Wake Forest, uh, there was a lot of time spent cutting film, um, doing different types of analysis, um, and that's when I kind of got pretty comfortable with all different types of Excel um, and did, did you know different type of software for uh, for computers. Okay, now so you finish up at Wake. Tell me about what happened and how you got to where you are now. 
Well, um, back in 2012, um, Bobby Muse, who was the assistant coach at Wake Forest, um, when I committed there back in 2005, had reached out and uh, about an opportunity here at the University of Denver. Um, I came out to the University of Denver to further my studies. Um, so I started going back to school and also to help uh, Bobby Muse build something. Uh, that was that was five years ago, um, and for three consecutive seasons, uh, we were extremely successful. And my old boss at Wake Forest got a new job, and then Bobby um, got the head coaching job at Wake Forest, and I bumped up. I think for me, there was a lot of um, time spent here at the University of Denver building uh, a certain culture and recruiting um, the certain certain kid, and that's obviously what I learned from. Uh, my experience at Wake Forest. And this is the first year that all these kids fell under that recruiting model. And that was, uh, you know, that you have to be a good person. And, um, you know, we're looking for certain characteristics in these individuals. So um, just extremely humbled uh, by the opportunity I had to, you know, to lead the University of Denver men's soccer team this past year. And um, just looking for, you know, uh, looking forward to the future years. I think it's kind of funny that, you know, Bobby left to go where you were. And then kind of going back and forth between Wake and, and Denver, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if uh, it's uh, definitely about your networks and, uh, you know, who you know. Okay, so huge accomplishments in your first season as a coach. I'll let you talk about them because basically it would be me just reading a list of accomplishments. Uh, so talk, talk about some of the real-world accomplishments that you had as a first-year coach. Uh, I think the biggest accomplishment is just to watch the kids um, – raise their level to the expectations and the new standards that we set forth and um, just to watch them get out of their comfort zone um, to push them in you know different facets of life whether it was school or academics or even socially um, that's been the most rewarding part and I think um, you know, winning is a byproduct of all those things. And, you know, obviously to, to, to be the only undefeated team in the country um, in the regular season, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if that will ever happen. Uh, the extreme difficulty to do that in soccer, um, where it's an unkind sport, it's a testament to my guys and their, you know, their preparation for every game. But it was definitely a season to remember. Uh, like I said, this was the first time that all these guys had fell under the recruiting model. So, um, just to be able to share that experience with with these guys was special. At the end of the season, obviously, you know, we lost in the round of 32. It was an unfortunate game, but at the same time, I plan to be in this uh, in this industry for a long time, so I'm sure I'm going to be on the other sides of those results. So in your first season, you were the Summit League Head Coach of the Year. Uh, you were also the youngest head coach in Division I. Um, you were the only undefeated team, as you mentioned, in the country going into the tournament. And your defensive statistics and, you know, goaltending and whatnot is mind-blowing. I mean, you guys, as a team, only gave up eight goals the whole season? Yeah, well, I think if you asked anybody who had ever seen me as a player, they would be surprised by those defensive statistics. Uh, I wasn't exactly a defensive uh, specialist or anything. I uh, very much relied on my attacking uh, savvy, uh, you know, to have the career that I did. But... Um, I think that last season, that was our strengths. And I think any good coach plays to his strengths. And, um, you know, to be able to only let up eight goals, you, you know, over the course of 20-plus games um, is really a testament to the guys understanding tactically what we were trying to do and um, executing on, on uh, game day. Well, specifically, you ended with the second-best goals against average in the entire country of .4. So that's, that's pretty good defense and goaltending. And... Uh, also, in addition to, you know, going to the tournament, you spent seven straight weeks in the top ten, which had never been done at the school, and two weeks at number seven, which was the highest in the program's history. How did that feel for you, doing that? I know you're proud of the guys, but, I mean, you have to feel a little bit of pride as, as a coach. Yeah, I think you feel pressure first. Having a team that has never really been ranked consistently in the top 20 and then to be in the top ten for, you know, almost uh, two-thirds of the season, there's a lot of pressure involved in it. And at the end of the day, I think we handled it quite well. And, uh, you know, although the season didn't end the way that we wanted to, I'm extremely proud of our guys. And, uh, you know, we bring back 22 of 24 players from last year's team. And, uh, you know, we're adding, you know, five, six players that we think, uh, you know, can help us right away. And since you got there in 2012, you guys are 50, 18, and 11, which is incredible, and three consecutive tournament bids. 
So a little bit of pressure, as you mentioned, to keep that going and to, uh, I guess, keep that streak alive? Yeah, definitely. But I think, uh, you know, my guys understand that that pressure just focus us, focuses us in more and, uh, you know, brings out the best in people. And some people crumble under that pressure and, you know, others, uh, others strive. You know, I would like to think that we're creating an environment every day in our training um, where, you know, we're testing them and we're putting them under that type of pressure. And then, uh, you know, that they're going to do quite well next year. So kind of wrapping up with your first season as the head coach, you guys had set a ton of Division One school marks, shutouts with 12, consecutive shutouts with seven, consecutive scoreless minutes, 797, and consecutive unbeaten matches with 18. So you guys set a bar for yourself, which a lot of times is good, but kind of, like you said, puts the pressure on for, for the future. I think a lot of coaches in my industry tell me that I came out uh, of the gates too quick with expectations, but, but uh, I just don't think you think about those things. You prepare, um, you know, we're extremely process oriented here at the University of Denver and, uh, you know, we're driven uh, by our mission and that is to, um, to prepare the student athletes for life after college. So uh, we just feel like all this winning and, you know, all the records that you're setting and, you know, all the accomplishments that these guys have is really just a byproduct of uh, you know the environment that we put them in on a daily basis. So although there's pressure and although uh, you, you know next year there's expectations, that's not things that we're going to worry about. We're just going to worry about uh, the process and enjoy the ride. Now you mentioned pressure and no more pressure than actually in education. You know, trying to do do well. Uh, you yourself are continuing your education, correct? Yes. Uh, tell me about that process because you're doing it right there where you. Or coaching too so that's got to be I would think a little strange for me if I were to do that attending the university that I'm also coaching um, talk about that yeah I think uh, I'm getting my master's in science and organizational leadership uh, with a with a focus in human capital uh, it's a mouthful but you know pretty much what it means is that uh, I am uh, learning how to align individuals goals uh, with the structures of uh, the organization you know th their goals their values and making sure that um, we're getting the vet the best version of themselves by the time that they're finished here in the organization and um, the classes have been difficult there's no doubt about that you know waking up early uh, doing schoolwork then going to actual work and then doing more schoolwork hasn't been fun but um, it's been extremely beneficial to, um, to my development as a coach. There's been tons and tons of um, proposals and uh, things that I've worked on papers that I've uh, directly inf have implemented to my job. Now, as far as crossover, I assume, obviously, you don't have any of your students in your classes, but do you, you see them on campus or crossover there where, you, you know, where you're attending class and you happen to see them as fellow peers, I guess, students going around? Not too much, but I think that probably leads to another question that a lot of uh, a lot of people wonder. You know, at, at age twenty nine, how am I able to um, kind of organize and lead? Uh, you know, a group of people that are aren't much older than me, and uh, I think for me, it's just it's just being honest with them, and um, you know, they understand that I care care very much about them as individuals before soccer players and um, you know so when they do see me go to class or they do see me studying and stuff like that there's obviously uh, you know a joke or two um, but at the end of the day they are you know they understand that I'm trying to further my you know my education and I'm uh, trying to better myself and you know for me as a as a leader you know to lead by example like that is uh, you know the best way that I can. Now obviously to do all this you need a, lot, a ton of support um, you mentioned earlier meeting your wife. She's your biggest supporter, you said. Tell me about her meeting her and, and just life in general now. Uh, she's changed my life. You know, she made me grow up uh, into a man, and uh, she makes me want to be a better person every day. Since I met her, my life has gotten um, so much better, uh, so much more focused, so much more driven. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, she's, she's the kind of – the most important piece to it all and you know that's something that I think uh, when you're working in division one sports you can lose sight of just because there's always something that you can be doing to try to get better but um, you know at the end of the day I want to be a good family man and you know that's what my father was to my family and you know that's what I'm trying to uh, you know hopefully do with mine. Uh, what when did you guys meet and how did how did you meet and when did you get married? Well, she actually uh, was tutoring the players at Wake Forest, and um, so we had just met through there. Um, I actually had called her uh, out of the blue, 
um, to just make sure that my guys were being respectful and, uh, you know, being um, diligent in their studies. Um, and then I had asked her out later uh, in the phone conversation. So it was a little bit of a dual f uh, uh, reasoning for calling. Um, you know, she still jokes about it that I didn't care about the players. Um, but now that she sees me, uh, you know, in the way that I work here at the University of Denver, she knows that's not true. But um, we got married in uh, 2014. Uh, down in Wilmington, uh, North Carolina. That was a place that we had vacationed. Uh, it's about three and a half hours from, from Wake Forest. And uh, it was Memorial Day weekend. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, you know, here in the next couple, uh, couple weeks to have our first kid. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, so you're from New Jersey. Where is Emily from? Emily's from Michigan. She grew up right outside of Detroit. Okay, great. What do you guys like to do? Um, you're both obviously very busy. What do you do as far as hobbies, you know, social life? What, do you, what are some of the things you like to do when you're not working? Yeah, we love to go out to dinner. Uh, we love to travel, uh, you know, whether that's domestically or internationally. Um, you, you know, we definitely enjoy traveling. Um, but for us, a lot of our lives, because, uh, you know, she is from Detroit and I'm from New Jersey, a lot of our downtime is spent going back there, you know, going back to the Jersey Shore in the summer or going up to the lakes in Michigan and then, uh, you know, coming around for the holidays. So our, our real down, downtime is spent with uh, family and friends. That's, you know, that's the most meaningful thing to us. So it sounds like you still see them a lot, uh, your, your home family. Yeah, it's definitely difficult. You know, I... Uh, I loved growing up outside Philadelphia. Uh, I think it taught me a lot, um, you know, about loyalty, honesty, about, uh, you know, just being a good person. And my brother is the head coach at Shawnee, you know, boys soccer. That's and Ryan, correct? Yes, yes. Uh, and then my little brother works at uh, the University of Penn, Kyle. So, and my parents are still in Medford. So I still have a lot of ties back there. Um, you know, try to go back there whenever I have a free opportunity. Um, you know, but just really appreciate uh, the whole community, um, Medford, Shawnee, and everything that, you know, uh, it prepared me for. Now, how much uh, do you and Ryan talk shop as far as, uh, you know, sharing ideas and kind of bouncing things off each other that may have worked for one of you, may not have worked for the other? Does that happen yeah. very much? Yeah, well, my younger brother, Brad, who is the assistant coach at uh, Elon University, where he went to school down in North Carolina, him and I obviously are in the same industry, so I, I get to see him on recruiting trips. I get to see him. Um, so there's a lot of more collaboration with, with Brad, but sure, anytime Ryan or I, um, you know, because he is the head coach, there are certain management things that I lean on him for. And, you know, Ryan's done a great job uh, within the community and, uh, you know, making sure that the right structures are in place. From a whole brother standpoint, all four of us, whenever we get together, we usually talk and shop. You know, that's what my life uh, has centered around. I'm sure my wife gets annoyed a bit. <laughs> now, going back, you said in your life there were two major milestones that kind of, uh, you know, set your life, um, I guess, what you were going to do and also, like, taught you a lot. Uh, you want to talk about them? One was when you were younger, and then one was when you were a little bit older. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the ultimate measure of the man is, 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 is during um, adversity. And I think that there was, a, you know, two times in particular in my career that uh, I had to make a decision. And one happened when I was pretty early, when I was 12 years old. Uh, I had made some, you know, U.S. select teams and some youth teams, and uh, that one year I didn't make it. And instead of pointing the finger and, you know, blaming on this and blaming on that, I, I took a hard look at myself. And at 12 years, 12 years old, I don't know uh, what I was really thinking, but uh, I just started to work harder than I ever had before. And then when success followed me that, 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 that next year, I had then laid the framework down for the work that needed to get done every year. And then that was kind of where I started to understand, you know, if you want to be successful in anything in life, there's a certain work ethic and commitment that's involved in it. Um, and then my professional career, you know, uh, I'm undersized, uh, uh, you know, I'm a certain type of player and uh, my professional career obviously didn't go the way that I would have uh, liked it to go. And instead of, uh, you know, being down about it or, or, or um, you know, continuing on, there was a moment where I had to pick a pick where, you know, was it coaching or was it playing? And um, my dad is really the one that, 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 that directed me towards coaching, and, you know, I couldn't thank him enough. 
Well, we come full circle now back to Shawnee High School, and I'd like to ask you if there are anything, anything you would redo or anything you would might do over back from Shawnee High School, if you could do it again. Uh, probably enjoy it a little bit more. I probably put a lot of uh, pressure on myself as a, as a young kid. Um, it's just to, you know, kind of enjoy the ride a little bit more. Uh, there's a lot of great people in that community. There's a lot of great, uh, you know, teachers in those hallways. And um, just I felt like because I had traveled a lot um, with, 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 with soccer uh, that, you know, some of my high school experience was, was – um, was quick and uh you know if i would to talking to a young jamie franks i would just tell him to enjoy it a little bit more because uh it was uh it was a fun ride well i appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today it's been fun no problem thanks again for having me thank you we've been speaking with shawnee alum jamie franks head men's soccer coach at the university of denver thank you for joining us today and please join us next time for more alumni interviews on where are they now <laughs>